morning, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> getting angry, he's getting his angry voice back. Slowly. Still in the heat wave. Ooh. Still need a new gearbox. Still late. I don't get out of bed on time, that's the trouble. All the problems with arriving late can be traced back to departing late. <laughs> and it's 8.30. I'm due at work at 8.45. So I'm never going to make it. But fortunately, <clears throat> I'm reliably late. So if I'm not there at quarter two, they will know I'm probably only about five minutes behind, which is is a shame because I really, the guy I bought the surgery off is a complete stickler for punctuality and uh, says to me, you know, when he sees me arriving in the morning, Derek, your first patient's there, been waiting 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, yes, thank you. He flies in from the States, so he's very, uh, how can I put it, he's like, uh, he's on a different clock, you know, he, if he wanted to get to work at 3 o'clock in the morning he could, because for him that would be, he's like 5 hours ahead of everyone, so when he comes over he's, he's always at work before me, uh, I think he does it to prove a point, or make a point. You know, it's just a silly thing. So, but um, no, I when I get up in the morning, it's not like I just get up in the morning and then and then dive into the shower. When I normally uh, wake up about six something, and then I have uh, like a routine of going through checking financial news and things like that, tickers and uh, news feeds. And then looking at the sun, looking at the Times crossword, and deciding I can't be bothered to do it. And uh, anyway, I have to have a whole routine. So, but the problem is, it then leads to um, tardiness. If it's you know, if there's more to be checked than normal. Anyway, you know. On the whole, we run on time. We had to, uh, we're having uh, problems with an issue that I've always had problems with ever since I owned my own surgery, and that is getting someone in to maintain your dental equipment, you know, finding a decent, half decent dental engineer. The guy we've got at the moment is not really a dental engineer, he's just someone who did a few exams to be able to sign equipment off for a friend. And so uh, he's not really any use. In fact, everything he fixes is he's sort of only barely fixed, you know. Like when he did uh, the, the cable between the x-ray handset and the x-ray unit was in a bad way so and it was just a it was the simplest of cables it was a curly cable that had two wires in it, it literally it was just a contact uh, you know close a circuit type switch just needed two wires and a little curly cord like a telephone an old style telephone handpiece curly cord and he ordered this cord and it's about 20 feet long and it's massive you know it's so heavy you know it's like very difficult to lift up and certainly not going to stay attached to the handpiece because of just the weight of the cord and so you know he, he's like most people who bodge everything they're not capable of saying no I've made a mistake 
ordering this, I'll send it back and get some, get the right one. Basically, he said I, I fitted it, but if you want me to, I'll, I'll cut it in half and shorten it. You know, because it, obviously it's too big and heavy. But then by that time, he's already done it. You know, he's already fitted it, and so he's already, he's fitted it on purpose because the sort of the implication is that. You know, uh, it'll be a nuisance to ask him to have to unfit it and then shorten it and refit it and everything. So you're you're being pushed towards saying, "Oh no, you know, leave it." And um, you know, and that's he considers that a job, a job done. You know, a job jobbed. So. Unfortunately, he's not. You know, the, the also we did we we got a leak in our three and one syringe, and so uh, we needed just a, a bog standard three and one syringe. And it's taken him about four months to not order this thing. And uh, it's just uh, stupid, you know. I mean, this is we just need a bog standard three and one syringe. Probably could be got from anywhere in the world, and he's just taking so long to do it. And, and then of course when anything is fixed they always like you know oh they want to charge they want to charge the maximum you know I mean they want to charge really like quite a lot to get stuff fixed you know like 300 quid or something for replacing this cable or something. and he you know and he takes my equipment <laughs> he, we had an old sterilizer we had a couple of old sterilizers and uh, he said to him, I'll, um, I'll take him up to the lab, you know, and see if I can get him fixed. So like a day later, he come, no, no, we can't get him fixed. I said, oh, let's have him back, then I'll put him on eBay. Yeah, I'll put him on eBay, he says. A day later, he comes back, no, I've had him on eBay, they're not worth, I've had a look on eBay, not worth anything. You know. So what does he do then? No, does he drop them back? No, they just vanish. It's so uh, it's so stupid you know, because like it's not like it's life or death to me whether a couple of old non-functional sterilizers go hand in. I know I know that there is a class of person for whom you know a couple of bits of junk like that are actually not a bad find. You know they're they're sort of you know I, I had a. An air rifle once, and I forget what was wrong with that. I think there was something wrong with the uh, uh, barrel or something. Anyway, I, and, and you know, a friend of my wife, her husband said, "Oh, I, you know, I fix things. You know, I fix things. I'll have a look at it for you." So I said, "All right then." So I gave him the air rifle, and he said, "No, it's um, you know, it's going to cost quite a lot to fix." So I said, well, I don't use this thing anymore, really. There's no need for it. So, uh, you know, if you think you can fix it, you can have it. And so that was, you know, that was the air rifle gone. To some, but for him, it was like quite a... He was like, oh, you never guess what I've got. I've only got, I've got an air rifle. It needs a new X, Y and Z or something. And then it's mine. But that's fine in a way you know I don't mind that because if you've got so much then you should why shouldn't you pass stuff on that's not you know that to you is of, of, of lesser value you know you have to I'm a great believer in trickle down wealth not that I regard a, a knackered autoclave and a, a knackered air rifle as wealth but at, a point, at some point in my life I would have done you know I remember someone when I was a boy someone gave me like a a, a snooker cue that nobody wanted and I was like oh my god you know there, this morning I didn't have a snooker cue now I've got a snooker cue ok it's not the best snooker cue in the world but it's a snooker cue I didn't have or when I was at school I needed a, a lab coat so I said to uh, 
I was worked at, on Saturdays at a butcher's and uh, I happened to mention to Malcolm, the guy who's the owner of the business, that I needed a lab coat and I asked him if I could, because the, the butchers wore white coats and um, they said, and these coats got absolutely plastered with um, meat uh, and crap, you know, and they never really washed out and after a while they got so bad, even after they were washed, they, they sent them to a laundry. So they came back like really pressed and crisp and starchy and everything, but still like with big brown stains down the front. And I said to Malcolm, you know, when you chuck one of these coats out, is it all right if I can I have it? Because it's, I need a lav coat for school. And he said, yeah, of course, yeah, no problem. And then next Saturday when I went in, he'd actually bought me two new coats two new butcher's coats. They were butcher's coats. They were lab coats, basically, but, you know, they were white, and, and the main thing is that they were new. And I was like, I can't believe it, you know. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that he'd been so generous as to actually spend money on, on solving my problem, which was, uh, you know, and it was a big problem, which was that I was at, in the science class at school without a lab coat. And here was this guy who really, I, you know, I was had a lot of, or I was in awe of him because he was the boss. And he just and said he just come in and said to me like it was my birthday, here's two lab coats. You know, it's amazing. I never forget it. We had um, a coal fire, uh, <clears throat> and we didn't have a grate. And it was quite a small fire because it was a cottage and so we couldn't find a grate and uh, a friend of mine, funnily enough, who's a bit of a hoarder, said I think I've got something like that in my garage. And he just went in the garage and he came out with this, this grate that we could use to have a fire. And I said to him, you know, what do you want for it? And he's like, no, no, I don't want anything for it. You, you have it, you just have it, you know, you just remember these things. When we did the um, franchise, we did uh, set up a dental franchise, and uh, in association with BDO Stoy Hayward and uh, uh, Lockton, the uh, brokers, etc. And Lockton said, uh, "You know, we wanted to do a launch," and they were like, "Yeah, well, you must come along and launch it at our our, our headquarters," you know. And so um, I was able to launch the franchise, you know, on the 34th floor of this fantastic building overlooking London. And uh, I think, you know, you know, how much would it cost to hire this room? And the, the answer was nothing. It didn't cost anything because they just donated the room to us. They said, no, we're, we're happy to host this launch. This is as we're part of it. They wanted to be associated with it first sort of dental franchise and um, and that, so they gave me that room and this is you know apart from my mother giving me life this is I've got a long list of people who've given me stuff when I wasn't expecting it you know and when I most needed it and I don't forget that you know it's like I'm quite emotional about it you know it's stuff that I needed and that people just gave me that I didn't realize that it was within their gift I didn't and I certainly didn't expect that they had the financial resources to just uh, say yeah go on you can have it you know don't worry about the money I didn't I <laughs> come from a family that didn't believe that there was such a thing as a person who said I'm not actually worried about the money we, we always worried about the money the money was mainly what you worried about. You know, you didn't, there, there weren't, these rich people weren't in my circle. And then I found that as I got a bit older, you know, increasingly there were a few of them, a few. And now you get to the point where you know probably quite a few. Whether they choose to exercise it, you know, whether they give stuff away is, uh, an interesting point because I, I can say I probably do know many people who have the 
potential, you know, who've got the resources to give give stuff away, and then, um, but don't, you know, they just don't, they're not in the right place to do that mentally. And it's not, you know, in my experience, the people who have had nothing tend to give more because they know what it's like to live on the edge. The people who really have always been quite comfortable um, never ever received anything. They never donate anything. <laughs> so anyway, back to I mean dental engineering. I've got to get a, I've got to get an engineer. I've got to try and we've got the local uh, Kent, uh, East Kent Community Trust are coming round to give us a quote for maintaining the autoclaves uh, or maintaining the um, X-ray machines and the compressors. X-ray machines and the compressors. That's right. But they can't do the chairs because we've got Anthos chairs. And the only people that maintain Anthos chairs is Clark Dental. And Clark Dental is well known as the most expensive dental company to do anything with. And if I ring Anthos and ask them who maintains their chairs in the UK, they will probably say Clark Dental. And it'll probably be only Clark Dental because it's such a small market, and you know, they're, they're, and the controls against you know, there's no who who makes sure that uh, anyone who wants to go into the in, to be a dental engineer is able to get Anthos spares, you know. Even if, assuming East Kental, East, East Kent Dental say they can't do Anthos because they can't get the parts. And they probably can't get the parts because Anthos only sends them to Clark Dental. So Clark Dental has effectively got the monopoly on the maintenance of Anthos chairs. And I think you need to think about that really carefully when you buy any dental equipment, you know. It's like when you install any new software, you have to say to yourself, is it open source? You know, can anyone read the um, read the code and make sure that it does exactly what it says it does and no more, no less? And um, data portability. If I put, if I spend years typing my data into this program, can I get it out again? Could I, if I decide to, if this company goes bust or if I decide to transfer to another program, can I transfer my data? You know, or is it would it be impossible? And it's the thing, it's the same with dental equipment. You, when you buy anything, look at what's the total cost of ownership. What's, you know, think ahead. Who's going to service this? Who's going to repair it? Is it, how am I going to operate it? Not, not just all lovely, how, when am I going to get it? How am I going to buy it? How am I going to finance it? When's it going to arrive? How does it work? But, but also, when it blows up, Who's going to come out and fix it? How far away are they? How quickly can they get here? What are their charges? Are they have they been around for a while, you know, or are they just like have they been in the market for a year and next year they'll probably decide they're going to do something else? So <clears throat> anyway, yeah. <clears throat> so um, I think we might have the um, compressors and the x-ray sorted out but not the, uh, the equipment but fortunately the equipment is um, so far is is holding up pretty well and I'm only four minutes late so actually I'm quite pleased with that and the car park is empty so I can only assume that means that everybody's down the beach lovely nice to talk to you have a nice day at work see you tomorrow bye